The Liverpool manager Gerard Houllier was rushed to hospital this afternoon. The 54 year old was seen by the club doctor at half time. Fix the blood pressure, it doesn't say anything, so we go to hospital. During his side's game with Leeds United. Still in intensive care after complaining of chest pains. I thought I was indestructible. Following a 12 hour operation at the cardiothoracic unit, his recovery is expected to take some time. Football nearly killed you. Football management is a tough job in a harsh and unforgiving industry. Success is all that matters, and failure is shown no mercy. In nearly 30 years of covering the sport that I love, I've been fortunate enough to watch the great and the good at work, up close and sometimes very personal. But now I want to dig deeper, to find out what it takes to be a celebrated and successful manager. What they were born with, who inspired them, and what they've learnt on their way to the very top of the game. The changes they've seen in football, and the changes they've helped create. These are my football godfathers. I've come to Paris to meet Gérard Houllier. Mon ami. My friend, <laughs> how are you? A footballing godfather with an extraordinary story. I don't kiss many managers, <laughs> only the French. <laughs> a man who rose from humble school teacher to the very top of football management. Not many French coaches had won the European trophy. And went from the depths of football despair... It's a really bad memory. ..to the heights of the game's glory. Emmy gave me his medal. A manager whose methods revolutionised Liverpool Football Club. He said, you put the club into the 21st century. A man whose affable manner belies a ruthless streak. Ooh, we know we have a boss. Do you regret saying that now? Yeah, of course. Joe, it's good to see you, as it always is. Thank you. You've had the most Thanks, extraordinary Jeff. life in football. Are you looking forward to looking back at it and reflecting? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm not looking forward to <laughs> looking at the back. <laughs> I stay on the ball because I think if you stay on the ball, you keep breathing and you keep living. <laughs> My father played himself in a, in a village uh, club and uh, he took me with him and uh, I think he was the captain of the team and I could play around, you know, near the dressing room and so on. That's, I remember, you know, some pictures or some, you know, souvenirs, some memories of having a ball under my arm and going and play with my friends uh, just around the changing room where they would uh, get, get changed and get prepared for the game, yeah. I started as a striker and then I moved back as a defensive midfield. Uh, I think I was more... Um, defensive midfield is more my personality, you know. Uh, you've got to get stuck into it. <laughs> At the same time, be a good passer, a fine passer. You were in... Liverpool as part of your studies. Yeah. But you chose to do a dissertation on being brought up in a deprived area. Yeah. What made you choose that subject and what made you choose that city? My, my lecturers at university, they were very surprised because I picked up Liverpool. Everybody would pick up London, Brighton, I mean, mm. all these towns. And I picked up Liverpool because there was two, uh, two big clubs. I mean, Everton was even bigger than Liverpool at the time. Yeah, I picked up Liverpool and for the clubs, for the football. I'm going to jog your memory now. Yeah. I brought a little gift for you. Ooh. What memories does this bring back? You need to look carefully. Oh. <laughs> I went with a friend who became my assistant coach in Liverpool, um, called Patrice Berg, 
and together we went to a game, and that was a European Fairs Cup. We, mm -hmm. And uh, so 1969, yeah, that's right. And uh, we uh, we went together in the cup. So it's funny because when I had my first press conference, somebody asked me, what do you know about Liverpool? I said, well, have you been to a game? I said, yes. And they were surprised. I said, I went to a European game where Liverpool won 10 nil because they, they won 10-0. <laughs> yes, I remember that. And I That's gave the one. name of the, of the uh, scorers and they were surprised. And... Uh, I mean, to witness a 10 nil victory, but did it make a big impression on you? Very, evening? very big, very big impression because of the, um, of the way they were still playing. At, at 8 nil, you thought they would be, they, they were at nil nil. They were playing the same way. I saw half of the game because it was swaying like that, you know, it was very funny. But I enjoyed that. It was great. Well, that's for you. Thank for you, you to, very much. For you to keep mm -hmm. and for you to enjoy. So you came back to France, you're a teacher, you've qualified. You do a little bit of coaching at the 2K, and, and, with, and within 10 years, you're the manager of the team that wins the top division in <laughs> France. It's an extraordinary transformation. How do you explain it? Luck. <laughs> uh, I tell you, first of all, let me go back to Le 2K. You know how to happen, you need to know that. I was playing in the team, like everybody, and the manager had been sacked because we were in the drop zone. And the uh, board appointed the captain. The captain had to do the training and also be the captain. The captain was absolutely scared and panicked. He came to me and said, Gerard, I know that you do with the kids in Aas where you live. Can you help me? I said, yes, OK, we'll help, I'll help you. So the team went back from the drop zone to the fifth place. And at the end of the season, he went to see the board and he said, Gerard does everything, so put him uh, player coach. So I was appointed player coach. And we finished first and we got promoted. So that's how I became a coach and still playing for the first team. So it was a lot of things. And you're still teaching in the And days, still huh? teaching. I got a phone call from the chairman. He said, there's a lot of vultures around the club. The only person I trust is you. We, we talk, and then I took the team. And the team was, at the time, the equivalent of the first division in England. Then we went back into the championship uh, the following year. Ayant hissé leur entraîneur Gérard Houillet sur leurs épaules. Les deux... C'est toujours un handicap lorsque la compétition se joue sur match aller-retour. And then I had uh, three or four years there, and good results in the cup and so on. That's how you know Lens, the club, the came first division, yeah, the Premier League club of Lens, uh, came and took me here. With Lance, I had some good results very quickly. And I realized probably I was made for the job. You know, sometimes you feel mm. this is my this is my track, this, this is, is my way. Yeah. You were the, the king of Paris, you were the emperor. <laughs> Do you regret saying that now? Yeah, of course. Is that still your most painful moment in football? It's a really bad memory. One I didn't know. He just he just passed away, didn't he, Tommy? I'm in France with football Christian godfather Roy. Gerard Houllier, Tommy Smith. a French football revolutionary. Be yourself, be brave. If you don't give everything, you don't succeed. An Anglophile who found his spiritual home in Liverpool. I was in the cop. The cop was swaying like that, you know. <laughs> and whose meteoric rise saw him go from teaching school children to coaching World Cup winners. When you're a manager, it requires so many facets. What is the single most important quality you have to have to be a successful manager? You need to have a kind of belief in yourself and in what you do, which is beyond some rational way of thinking, you know. You need to have some kind of intense belief in yourself that what you're going to do is going to be successful. 
Um, I mean, we, we all have our doubts. We all have, you know, moments when we question us on the on the work and so on. But the I would say to have an intense belief of I'm going to make it. It was this self-belief and conviction which, in 1985, saw Julier plucked from relative obscurity at Lens to be appointed manager of one of the biggest clubs in France, Paris Saint-Germain. Success came instantly. In his first season, he guided them to the league earned title. It is a truly remarkable journey and transformation from being a teacher to, within just over a decade, yeah. win the top division title with yeah. Paris Saint-Germain. And no title had been won here for 50 years. So it was a special oh. celebration. You, no, you were, you were the, the king of Paris. You were the <laughs> emperor. So what made you decide to step away from that to go and work with the French Federation? I was coming from a teaching background. I think technical director, to me, is a, one who has a vision, uh, have a plan, the coaching of coaches in the youth national team and the grassroots. And that was me, something which is like a teacher, you know. The French Football Federation were impressed by Julier's visionary thinking, appointing him technical director in 1988. Initially, he worked alongside head coach Michel Platini, but took over the role himself fully four years later. His first major task was to ensure qualification for the World Cup finals to be held in the USA. Going into their last game against Bulgaria, they needed just a point to qualify. They were virtually there, with the scores level and just seconds left. They had possession, now they just had to see the game out. <laughs> France were out. Is that still your most painful moment in football? It's a really bad memory. Hopefully it's not for many, many years to come, but in your obituary that game will be mentioned. As of course, as you well know, your famous quote on the night about David Ginola. Hmm. He drove an exocet through the heart of French football. Do you regret saying that now? Yeah, of course. Le fait qu'un joueur ait craqué, à mon avis, a constitué sûrement une goutte d'acide importante, parce que là, David Ginola a commis un crime contre l'équipe. Je répète, un crime contre l'équipe. I was not happy with David because of his declaration in the press 48 hours before the game. He said he, he lacked respect to his teammates. He said, I should play. You know, I don't understand why Papa and Canton are playing. And I was not happy with Ginola because I knew it was he would split the team. I mean, I said, never mind who plays at the moment. What we need is to qualify and then we'll see. So the combination of what he had said previously plus his carelessness at the end of the game. No, no, that's a fact. I know he, sh he should have done something different because, you know, if you, if you see an under-13 or under-14 uh, game, when it's one minute or even the game was, was over, was already finished, you know, if somebody gives you the ball, you go to the corner flag. We'll do that. But anyway, that's, that's a fact of game. You can't blame David for the... Uh, he, miss, he, he, miss. Felt that you he felt no, that you singled no, well, him that's out. that's easy. No, no, no. He, he, you know, the, the, the cross, after the cross, there was, a, I mean, there was a two or three passes and one, two passes and, and players who were in position. I mean, the defenders could be blamed. The, everybody could be blamed. Bulgaria is, uh, is something I want to forget because uh, it makes me think... Uh, at one stage, when I was looking at my family and my the people very close to me, uh, I wanted to stop playing football. He crossed what is one of your core beliefs is, which is team before individual. Yeah. Yeah. Think team first. But he, I, I personally think that he, he felt he was immune because he was doing well. But Emi Jacquet had to experience the same thing. 
you know, he took him back in the team and so on. But one day he realised, you know. But this, this has rumbled on for nearly a quarter of a century. I mean, he tried to take you to court, mm -hmm. except. Yeah. Do you wish you? He could... lost, by the way. He oh. lost. Yeah. Do you wish you could shake hands and make it up? Yes, I try, but you know, it's, it's, uh, it's finished now. I mean, I've got to pass. You know. It's gone. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's it gone. I mean, I know he had a heart attack, or he nearly. Uh, so I would have loved. I mean, I asked her about him, you know, to a friend of mine, who's a mutual friend. But I mean, really, uh, this is the past. I mean, he's when, doing when well. he had his heart attack. For obvious reasons, were you tempted to to reach out to send a message? I did through a friend. Response? No. Following the disastrous Bulgaria defeat, Houllier was replaced as head coach by his assistant, Aimé Jacquet. Houllier stayed on as technical director of the France Football Federation. The next day, they said, "Come on, you stay technical director, do your job. We trust you. We believe in you." I was helped because I failed. Sometimes a defeat or sometimes, a, you know, a, a failure is, instead of being a crisis, can be a good opportunity. We had started the plan in 90, 1988 when I became the technical director. They trust me to lead the reform and to work with Emi Jacquet, of course. We had to change things in the coaching and the training and the ideas on the field and that's why we it gave rise to the generation of uh, Djokaev, you know, uh, Dugari, Zidane. Uh, had I won that game, I don't think I would have been able to implement the, 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 the scheme and the plan that we had, whereas it was in a case of urgency you can feel how people react. And I think the people of the FA, they were very good. They reacted very well. Compare and contrast that feeling, so not qualifying for the 94 World Cup, to the 1998 World Cup final, where Aimé Jacquet, your assistant, is the manager of the team. They win the World Cup on home soil, but such is your influence on the team, around the team, and the players that are in it, mm. that they insist on striking another winner's medal for you. Yeah, Emmy, Emmy gave me his medal. Because of your contribution. What, yes. what did that mean to you? More than any victory. <laughs> um, I was extremely moved because, you know, in, uh, in football, uh, gratitude and... Uh, is not a, a common <laughs> I would say quality um, people seem to forget but Emil was fantastic funny enough in 1988 Emil Jacquet was sacked from Bordeaux and in 1998 which is 88, 98 10 years he becomes world champion can you imagine? <laughs> so th this is a good lesson in life Jeff talent bounces back always when you have talent and you work and you're, you know, reliable, serious, you always bounce back. So I think it's, um, it's a good lesson in life. And it, it epitomizes what I think, that talent bounces back. Tal true talent is a bounce back. Jimmy Carragher mentioned that, you know, that day, oof, we know we have a boss. It moved me to tears, yes. Until that date, I thought I was indestructible. To me, a captain, if he leaves the field, it's on a stretcher and goes straight to the hospital. That's not my vision of the captain. In this episode of Football Godfathers, I'm with Gerard Houllier, looking back on his career in football management. Gerard who? <laughs> In the summer of 1998, as technical director of the French Football Federation, he'd helped mastermind France's World Cup victory. This brought him to the attention of Liverpool, and he was approached by the club that he'd watched from the cop as a young man. He became joint manager with Roy Evans, 
and the first foreign manager in the club's 106-year history. You can have considerable talent, but also you can have some considerable battles as well and obstacles in your way. When you joined Liverpool, in particular, you're an outsider. I mean, how many, how many things were against you? <laughs> because there was a tradition, a boot room tradition. You know, Shankly, Paisley, Fagan, Kenny, Graham and, uh, and Roy. Roy Evans. So, I mean, there was a boot room tradition. I mean, Gerard who? So that's the first thing. Second, I changed, not revolution. I don't like the word revolution. Evolution. Yeah, evolution is a better word for the way to practice, to, uh, to prepare the game, you know, uh, the diet for players and so on. So we, we, we got rid of the drinking tradition that there were in many clubs anyway, not only in Liverpool. So we, we, we managed to move forward, I would say, on a professional way. I heard players at training saying, you know, we'll do the Frenchies. Because we were two French, it was Patrice Berg and myself. And I said, be careful because I understand English. <laughs> you know, we'll they do were the plotting French. to get you sacked. Yeah, because, you know, that's normal. Did that just make you more determined, though? Yeah. Well, There's one meeting in uh, November in Liverpool, and I said, well, listen, this doesn't work. I mean, the, this joint management doesn't work. I don't think the team was playing for me because we were training harder, we were, you know, having different routines and so on. If you it want... It was never going to work, though, yeah, was it? Yeah, but, I mean, you know, you knew we that. had different personality, different things. Oh, come on, be honest. Do you honestly think you could be joint managers anywhere in the world? It, it hardly ever happens. There has it's, to be one boss, doesn't there? Yeah. And it happened, it, there's one, it must be one boss, yeah. It's easy. It it's because the players, you know, the players, they go, they go the easy route. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Today is a sad day for Liverpool Football Club. We have agreed by mutual consent that Roy Evans had to leave the club. And they decided Roy had to leave, unfortunately. But I thought, you know, Roy could be, a, you know, we could work together. Uh, but it doesn't work. Anyway. How did you go about getting the Liverpool players on side. Was there one moment where they had started to believe in you and your methods? At some stage there was a game where um, Carragher mentioned that I had um, a talk with a player, and particularly with my captain at the time. Who was? Paul Ince. So I don't want to be controversial because he did some good things, you know. And but he left the team where we were winning one nil in Manchester in the cup. We lost two nil, two one. He came that off with exhaustion. He came off with exhaustion, didn't he? Or he, he complained of tiredness. Yeah, but I mean, it wasn't a specific injury. Practically two was days it? later, he was uh, doing a five side. I had a go at him. I explained to Paul, he was a captain. That to me, a captain, if he leaves the field. It's on a stretcher and goes straight to the hospital. That's my vision of the captain. And I think Jimmy Carragher mentioned that, you know, that day, ooh, we know we have a boss. I probably think that that was in January or February. Just over two years in, you then have the golden season of all seasons. That was the third season. Mm. And in fact, that's why I said we need at a minimum of two seasons to reap the benefits and the um, the the fact that the team is new and uh, they sort of play together and you know get used to each other and so on. And I think that um, you know 2001 was probably uh, in terms of uh, trophy winning and probably one of the best. Yeah.
what was it like for you as a manager? Because we know for players the joy of scoring a goal or mm -hmm. great moments. On the... But as a manager, what's it like? Well, you take pride in what your player achieve, eh? because it's the players who again win the the, the games and uh, win the trophy. But you, um, first of all, I mean, Liverpool had not won a trophy for a long time. That brought a, a huge relief to uh, to the squad. You know, we we made one at least. Mm. What's your standout memory of that period? Is it a particular game or, or a particular moment in one of the finals? As a Frenchman, of course, the uh, UEFA Cup final, because <laughs> there, there was the three cups were there. At the, you know, after the uh, the final match of the season, mm. we had a, a celebration. The cups were there, and people wanted photo with the cups and so on. And I said to Michael Owen, I said, which one do you prefer? And he said, this one, and he showed the FA Cup. He said, because when you are a young, uh, a young kid and you are a young player, your dream is to go to Wembley or to play in an FA Cup final. And uh, so he said, that's the one I prefer. And he said, but you, boss, you prefer that one. And he showed the UEFA Cup. And it's true, because um, not many French coaches had won uh, the European trophy. October the 13th, 2001. Mm. In the last hour, Gerard Houllier was transferred by ambulance from the Royal Liverpool Hospital to a nearby cardiothoracic centre to undergo further tests. Half-time against Leeds, you're feeling unwell. You end up being rushed to hospital and then there's a 10-hour emergency operation to save your life. <clears throat> yeah, well... What are your reflections on the I was the not feeling... Um, I, I thought I had the flu. I thought it was just something minor. So I asked the doc, you know, give me some C vitamin and then we'll go and see the second half. So I did the half-time team talk and... Uh, and then when the players left, I went to see the doc in his treatment room. Doc, do an injection of vitamin C. And he said, uh, no, no, we'll, um, you know, I'll, I'll take your blood pressure first. He takes the blood pressure, he doesn't say anything. He said, we go to the hospital. I said, come on, doc. So I just, um, I remember, I, w I just uh, left the table and went to the changing room. He said, no, 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 it could be serious. We don't know. I mean, maybe it's nothing. But you have to. Um, so I said, "Well, warn my wife and my uh, my son, and they'll come down." But he says, "So we go to hospital." When did you realise you were in serious trouble? When somebody in the hospital said, "Do you want to speak to somebody in particular before the operation?" So, <laughs> so I said, "Yes, maybe my mother and uh, my brother and my wife was there, of course." Gerard Houllier's wife, Isabel, has been at her husband's bedside all day in intensive care. But the doctor said to you, you know, this operation, they are not 100% no, successful. They told, they told my wife and told me. But I said, don't worry, I mean, I'm, I'm all right. I'm, I'm, I've taken risk of my life, it'll be OK. But not risks like that. Seriously, though, Gerard, I can't imagine what it's like to sit there speaking to your wife. You're about to go and have an operation, mm. and there's a possibility might be the last conversation you have with anybody. Yeah. Did, did it dawn on you at the time? No. No, because I was convinced that it'd be all right. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that, quite literally, football nearly killed you. I was working hard. We were planning the... <clears throat> the new facilities and so on. So uh, it's true that, you know, there was a lot of uh, to do in my plate. And um, But, you know, until that age, until that date, where I was 54, I thought I was indestructible. I thought I was, you know, I could do everything. But I get the feeling from listening to you and then and, and looking back, that it didn't really slow you down. When you were, as soon as you were capable in hospital, you're ringing Phil Thompson with your thoughts on the team. You wanted to get back 
as soon as possible. Somebody said to you, look, why, why don't you forget about football? And you said, why don't I forget about breathing? <laughs> True. You couldn't, see, you couldn't see it, could you? Yeah, no, I couldn't see it, no. I wanted to go back as soon as possible. Probably I did a mistake. I came back too early. Given that you stubbornly refused to accept that you couldn't be going back to the first team when you're in hospital, you were itching to get back there, you were impatient to get back to work. What emotion did you feel, though, when you saw that mosaic held aloft? It was a game against Manchester United and they had this mosaic. I was at home with a friend and my wife was at the game and we watched that and it was phew, breathtaking. I mean, it was emotionally very, very moving. Did you feel the power of the emotion yeah. and the, and yeah. the, and the yeah. effect, or well, the love for you yeah. from your own fans? Incred incredible, incredible. What did that mean to you? Were you moved at home? I was moved, and I must say, I was emotionally really touched, really. When you go through an operation, particularly a big operation, usually after that you get a bit too emotional. Mm. And uh, that happens, but that was... It moved me to tears, yes, I must say. And what was it like the night you actually came back for the Roma game? Well, that was, that was special, because we didn't tell anybody. I mean, only Phil Thompson knew. And uh, I came at, uh, at the, for the team talk. I did the team talk. I don't think the players, you know, listened much more of the team talk. They were so surprised. And um, I, d I didn't want to have the focus on my comeback instead of having the focus on the game and the players. So I think if I had, you know, sort of rolled it or worn, you know, I'm back that day. Mm. There would have been uh, a lot of in the press and so on. I thought it was better to keep the, you know, low profile and uh, leave the uh, the pressure of the game. It's enough like that. And in fact, the, the the fans, you know, particularly the cop, they saw me, and and it spread round the the stadium. It's Jaluri, and then they sang my name and so on. It was special. Was your opposite number, Fabio Capello, surprised? Oh, he, was, he was very surprised, and when he, he told me later, he told me, when I saw you, I knew it, was, <laughs> it, was, it would be difficult, he said. And to say, but, you know, it's a hug. He hugged me for about 20, 25 seconds, which is long. And, uh, of course, the, the crowd was fantastic because it spread round all the, the stadium that I was back, and um, there was a huge... Um, friendly atmosphere, it was special. Suddenly the cop realised I was on the touchline and it was... Uh, I don't think it was wise for me to do that because it was too early, but I knew it would help the team and we won 2-0. Over the years, what would you say has been the most valuable lesson that you learnt? I think generosity always pays off. Generosity in your effort, in your work, and of course in your kindness in the way you look after people take care of people I think you need uh, I would say on the long run if you're a generous uh, man uh, a man with a heart with humanity it always pays off I would agree you're certainly that I've been the, the beneficiary of that generosity I was more scared the second time Ooh, I thought you know it's the end one of the best compliments I had, you put the club into the 21st century. It's an unfair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Who's the best player you ever managed and why? Um... I've been in Paris with footballing godfather Gerard Houllier. Leadership is a transfer of emotion. If you're sad, they are sad. A man who, in the space of 15 years, went from English teacher to a treble winner at Liverpool. Big lump in the throat. Yeah, big lump in the throat. Very emotional. After leaving Liverpool in 2004, he won two more titles in his native France with Lyon before returning to England in 2010 for what would be his last managerial job with Aston Villa. You had a very, very eventful six years with Liverpool. You come back to France, and then you go back to Aston Villa as well. It's as though the health scare 
hadn't really impacted on you at all. No. Well, now it has. If if I had not had been through that, you know, illness, if I had not had that, I would be probably in England still with one club, you know, uh, in a job somewhere. You, <laughs> I was more scared the second time when it happened in Aston Villa. Mm. Oh, yeah, because that, that was extremely painful and uh, I was more scared, really, because I thought, you know, it's the end. I mean, when you are in good health, you know, you, you, keep, you keep what you like to do because otherwise you get depressed. Mm. Um, you, you like the adrenaline of the competition and uh, the preparation, the day-to-day -day involvement with the players and so on. Um, I mean, the, the, uh, what happened in April, end of April uh, 2011 in Aston Villa put definitely an end to uh, my coaching career or my coaching uh, I would say <laughs> liking Was that by your choice? No, the doctor the doctor said now you're in danger if you go back I was tempted to go back but every time the all the doctors in France said you know you've got to keep away keep out of the job which is difficult the key of my survival is a, a, a low uh, blood pressure, of course, and uh, and also the the medicines you know that I'm taking every day because of all this. You know. If you could travel back in time, what would you say to a young Gerard Houllier, oh. just starting out in his management career? What advice would you give him? I would say, be yourself, stay yourself. It's not a job where you're acting; it's a job where your personality must ooze and express itself. Be brave, because it's, uh, it's a job where at some stage you have to take decision. And uh, I would say be prepared. Be prepared to, to sacrifice uh, sometimes your family, your work, uh, your, your health sometimes, and, uh, because it's a 150% job. And if you, if you don't give everything in it, you don't succeed. So what do you think your footballing legacy is, Gerard? Jeff, I think every club I went to, I built something, you know. Whether, including the Federation? Including the Federation. I mean, I, I was the technical director for 10 years, and I can tell you I had a plan, a strategy, and we wanted to reach targets, which we did. We managed to develop players. Uh, I myself was in charge of the under-17, under-18. That's when the... Uh, likes of Thierry Henry, Trezeguet, Anelka, and so forth, Galas and so on, you know, Michael Silvestre, they all went through that generation. And they won the first youth trophy for, for France. We, we never won anything before. I mean, we can talk about the mission of the coach, but one of the mission is to make people progress. I mean, Michael Owen improved his left foot because at some stage he managed to use his left foot in training and so on. He was absolutely outstanding with the right foot. But when you're in a position on the left and you have to cut back to use your right foot, the goalkeeper knows the angles, the, the, the defender knows that he has to push you on your left. But when you can use both, it's different. And of course he was gifted. But I'm pleased that you know he scored over 40 goals in the year, and he, he became a top, top world... Um, he, he belongs to the Ballon d'Or family. Michael Owen with the Ballon d'Or! I mean, that's, that, to me, is a, a fantastic award. I don't think he realised at the time how important it was. It's an unfair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Who's the best player you ever managed, and why? The most... Uh, complete, comprehensive player would be Steven Gerrard because um, he was fast, he was strong, he could tackle, he could deliver a pass, he could uh, score himself. Uh, his attributes were practically comprehensive, you know, he got everything. So I would say all around is the best player. 
In football, what would you say is your proudest achievement? When I look back, I'm proud of the way we managed to turn things around in Liverpool. Because in Liverpool, the change was from there to there. You know, we, we really changed things around. I mean, the competition has, has uh, really is getting harsher and harsher. And we had to catch up. And to catch up, we had to do things collectively. And, um, and even when you do that, you're not sure to win. We won as a team. I felt really I contributed to, to the success of that. One of the best compliments I had uh, when I left is the chairman said that you put the club into the 21st century. And I think that was a good compliment. I mean, one of the players told me in the changing room in Istanbul, if we won today, it's because you gave us belief in the UEFA Cup, because we won it and, you know, probably uh, it helped us to believe in ourselves. If you could do it all again, would you, and would you change anything? I would look after myself a bit more. If you have also one advice to give to people, look after yourself. Because um, um, this, uh, it drains you a lot of energy, that job. So you need to have some time where you relax, keep cool and put things into perspective. Um, maybe every club I went, I had a, a, maybe a lot to do and a lot to look after, but really, uh, because leadership is a transfer of emotion. If you're tired, they're tired. If you're sad, if you if if you're sad, they are sad. If you if you lack enthusiasm, they will lack enthusiasm. If you are beat, they'll be a beat. And sometimes it's good. To have the energy, the positive energy, it's good to sometimes have a break. So I would say probably I would look more after myself. Gerard, it's been absolutely wonderful looking Thank back you. at your history. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have, and hopefully you've still got many more chapters to yeah, write. Yeah, you brought back a lot of memories to me. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely Thank to you. see you.